All right, we're recording. Okay, guys. Um, look, I actually practiced this last night and have some things written out, so um, it's gonna be really good. Proud of you. Oh, proud of you too. All right. Um, our base color is gonna be blue. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So. Up at the top there, our first couple of words are myofibril and myofilament. Here, I'll actually go to this page. Okay, so first thing to understand is this. We're talking about muscle fibers. If you remember from our last unit, our muscles are grouped into these bundles of like smaller and smaller and smaller units, okay? The, the smallest unit is a muscle fiber. And it kind of looks like, let's see. So this is just a muscle fiber. And here, I'll, I'll label it. Okay. So that's a muscle fiber, fiber. And a muscle fiber is a bundle of a whole bunch of smaller things called myofibrils. So there's these smaller tubes inside of there. Okay, so now you guys understand it. There's not actually like a tube with one tube sticking out of it like that. I've shown it sticking out to sort of like so you guys can see it. They're actually all bundled and really tied together. Okay, so a muscle fiber is made of, bundled up, myofibrils. All right, so here, we'll go. Muscle fiber is made of myofibrils. All right, so that's our first word, myofibril. It's literally that thing, it's the, the things that make up a muscle fiber. Yeah, what's up? I, I thought that the muscle fiber, I thought the myo, how like, no, never mind. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that the myo, how like, no, never mind. Feel again? Yeah, no, it's the sarcomere chain together makes a myo fiber. Correct. And then the muscle fiber is a myo fiber bundle. Bundle, yep. Mm -hmm. So, it's almost like bundling. Yes, yeah, yeah, the smallest unit that ends up bundled together. But yeah, we are in a second, we're gonna split the myofibril and zoom in a little bit more into sarcomeres. Okay, so this is really just to understand where these things all come from, all right? So when we zoom in a little bit more, all right, so I'm gonna kinda like draw an arrow like that to show that we're zooming in. All right, when we zoom in a little bit more, all right, so that's one individual myofibril. The myofibril looks like it's sliced up into chunks. And those individual chunks are called sarcomeres. So the sarcomeres are the pieces that connect together. And in fact, here I'll do this even. So there's a whole bunch of sections that make up the myofibrils. I feel like this arrow is weird looking. Let's redo that arrow. Sorry, what was the question? What's the function? The function, okay. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm trying to decide how much I want to give you right now before we dig deeper into like what the sarcomere does. But the, the function of the sarcomere is that each individual sarcomere has the ability to contract down smaller. So a contract, and in fact, let's even show like what a contracted. So watch. 
No, we haven't done myofilaments yet. So, so each each individual myofibril, the sarcomeres can contract down, and ultimately we're going to see. I'm not going to write it yet, but these things are called Z lines, and they literally have like zigzaggy Z lines. Um, the Z lines get closer together, and the whole thing contracts and pulls in closer, which, like, that's exactly what our muscles do, right? Like, you think about your muscle, it contracts and shortens, and that's what causes your bones to move. Do you know what happened to my side? Tell me about it. It's going it's to be on the video. So yesterday, I was getting this, like, I was getting puppy up, and she was, like, massaging something in my arm, and she, like, kept hitting the same spot where my hand was, like, this, and it just, like, made, like, these two fingers move out. Interesting. You're reading cupping then, huh? Like, you know what that is? I've, I've heard of it. Okay. <clears throat> so, I'm going to draw... I'm going to draw one more thing on here before we move to the next drawing. So... The outside of myofibrils are actually covered in this web of stuff. I'll color it in green. And so it kind of looks so there's this web of stuff that covers the outside of the entire myofibril, and it is called. I feel like this green is not going to be easy to see from back there. I need a bridge here. I wish I had like a stool. This would be less dangerous. Okay. It's covered in sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's this stuff that is covered around the outside of each myofibril. So each individual? Each individual myofibril is covered in sarcoplasmic reticulum. Yep. Myofibril. See, these are the individual myofibrils. They're covered in sarcoplasmic reticulum. The function of sarcoplasmic, see, see how sarcoplasmic reticulum is way down here at the bottom? We'll get into the function of that in a little bit, but I want to show you there where it's at so that later on when we get into the function, you'll kind of understand it. All right. My next set of notes. How do I want to do this? So we need to, I'm going to draw another drawing over here that is sort of zoomed in on what the sarcomere looks like. All right, so we'll kind of draw that same, that arrow means we're zooming in a little bit. And so I'm gonna draw one individual, um, gotta kind of make those match. All right, so this is one individual sarcomere. All right, so each myofibril is made up of a bunch of them connected together. This is what one individual one is going to look like. Okay? So, these things here, um, are we okay with blue? Should I, should I label some stuff in red? What are we talking about now? Are we talking, are we talking about sarcomere? So, the whole thing is a sarc... Oh, crud. Can't cuss on the video. So, the whole thing is a sarcomere. Right, so like this whole thing is a sarcomere. This is gonna be a diagram of one particular sarcomere, okay? So sarcomeres, let's just draw how it kind of looks. All right, they've got these little thin filaments, and then they also have these big, thick 
chunky filaments. And those filaments, they fit together, just like if you took your fingers and overlapped the ends of your fingers like this, okay? Not all the way together, but if they're just overlapped a little bit, all right? That's kind of how they fit together. All right. All right, so they have names, all right? And this is, so, so these are sort of like the big things, and I'll use red for this. All right, so sarcomeres are made of two proteins called myofilaments, All right? So the stuff that fills in the myofibrils are called myofilaments. So notice how we're always like kind of, we're kind of like digging down to a deeper level, right? Like this big thing is made of these little things, which are made of these little things, which are made of these little things, all right? So myofibrils are made of myofilaments. There are two myofilaments you need to know. The myofilaments are Actin, which is thin myofilament, and myosin, which is thick. So actin and myosin? Actin and myosin. Yep. Okay. Questions so far? You do need to be able to recognize some different areas of this. I'll label them, and then on, up on the screen, I'll show you guys an actual picture of it, and it'll make a lot of sense, okay? So, this area here that sort of defines the edges of each sarcomere, it sort of splits, it splits the, the whole my, uh, the myo, myofibril into chunks, that's called the Z line. Seven emails. So the Z line divides into different sarcomeres. The Z line is also connected to the actin. Yeah. So if you notice this, guys, when I showed relaxed versus contracted, do you see how the Z lines are closer together and the contracted? So the whole process of muscles contracting is about pulling the Z lines closer together. So as I explain this contraction process, I want you to be thinking about how these Z lines can pull closer together and what happens is, if you pull a whole bunch of Z-lines all closer together, then the whole muscle fiber will get shorter. All right. Now, the 
this section down the middle of the sarcomere that goes from one end of the myosin to the other end of the myosin, this is the most confusing part, okay? This is called the A band. Now, here's what's confusing. A is the first letter of active. And you're gonna think to yourself, okay, the A band, that must be about the active. The A band is actually about the myosin. It's, the, it's like opposite of what you would think. It's the whole width of the thick myosin filament. So you're gonna have to do something in your brain, one of Liana's little like tricks to remember that the A band is the opposite of what you would think it is. It's actually the width of the myosin, not the width of the active. Yeah. Myosin. I know this is so that's why I'm kind of want, I'm trying to write all this out nice and slow because when you start getting into myofibrils and myofilament and myosin, I, I know that all those terms are similar. Okay, so um, the A band is the the width of the myosin. Did you have a question, Jackie? No, that was it. Okay. So, yeah, we should probably change that to, because I, I don't know that I would say the A band necessarily has like a, like a function as much as it's just like a label that we put on a zone. Um, let me give you the other one and then I'll show you a picture and maybe it'll all make sense, but also maybe it won't, I'm not sure. Okay, we have another section from here to here, and that is called the H zone. All right, so from the end of the actin to the end of the other actin, that space in the middle where the actins don't quite touch, that's called the H zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from the end of the actin to the end of the actin, that's the H zone. The H zone and the A band overlap, right? So like the H zone is actually a part of the, the A band. Okay, this is weird and confusing and horrible so far, right? Trying to remember those things? It's tough for me. Let me see if I can, let's pull up a picture real quick. Okay, so that little black and white picture, that's an actual like photo from a microscope of a sarcomere. So the original scientists that were like giving all these names, they were really, when they said Z line, A band, H zone, they were really just naming what they saw in this picture. Um, and lucky for you guys, they were German so they gave them German names and then abbreviations based on those German names. So on the test, is, that, is it going to give us the full names? Is it going to give the full what? The names, or is it just going to give us the full Oh, yeah, it'll be those. You, you won't have to know like the German names. Um, so you can see the Z lines are really definite. Like that's why they. That's why they decided, hey, this is split into these different zones, because you can see the edges of those zones really, really clearly in a picture. So those dark black lines are Z lines. Um, and then you can kind of think, so this area out here, where it's really light colored, so it's light colored because the only type of filament are these really thin actin filaments. 
And then we get this darker zone because that's where the actin and the myosin are already overlapping. So we've got a lot more filaments in that area because we've got actin filaments and myosin filaments in this sort of darker gray zone. And notice that they are calling that whole dark gray zone, that's the A band. Um, the black lines are the Z lines. Yep. Just what kind of scan does that look like? Uh, I mean, I don't. I, I mean, it's from a microscope. Oh. Yeah, it'd be like a microscope that can take a so photo. Like, uh, I guess. Yeah. Really small. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's very, very, very small. Yeah. Here's a question: Do you want to know? the German words that H and A come from? Or is that going to make your brain melt? No. Okay, so, so some of you may turn your brains. I won't write them down. How about that, okay? But I had to know, so I had to look it up, okay? The easiest to understand is H. H is short for Heller. So Heller, any, any German speakers? Heller means bright. So the H zone shows up as this brighter area down the middle of the A band. So they called it the Heller zone, which it'd be, it'd be so much easier if it was in English and we called it like the B zone because it'd be bright. But instead, we have to remember that it's H for Heller, okay? You don't need to know the word Heller, Sophia, so just block, don't let it go in your brain right now. Just block your brain. Um, okay. Z is also kind of easy to understand. So Z stands for Zweischen, and Zweischen means between. So the Z line is between the different sections. That one makes a lot of sense, okay? Um, a is, A and I are, um, they're, they're more annoying. Um, so A stands for, I had to write this down, anisotropic. Um, and then I stands for isotropic, so, or maybe anisotropic, probably anisotropic. Um, and apparently when you, when you look at the A zone through a polarized microscope, you guys know what polarized is? Like your sunglasses are often polarized. And polarized is weird, it like blocks out one direction of light wavelengths but not the other direction of light, light wavelengths. So apparently when you look at the A band underneath of that type of microscope, like it, ha it, it looks different, but the I band doesn't look different under that. And so those words, isotropic and anisotropic, have to do with that. So now you know, you won't have to know that on the test, so I would not like freak out over those things. Yeah. Do we have to know what the I band is? That's not so the I band is not listed on our curriculum. So. I would be very surprised if I saw a question where you were responsible for knowing the I-band. I don't know why they left it off because it, it's on the same list of, like, it, it would make sense for it to be on there to me, but from what I can tell, you won't be responsible for it on the test, okay? Wait, is it closed up on the side? Sorry, I'm going back to Do you mean like what's the end of this actually look like? Yeah, because it looks like on one side it's open and it's closing. Oh no, I just drew it like that to make it look like it's a uh, oh. like it's a, a tube because it is kind of tube shaped. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, in reality, like it's not really a two dimensional thing like this. It's like in three dimensions there are lots of these actin and myosin fibers running all through that in like a tube shape. But we, I gave you like a cross section of what that tube might look like. So wait, that thing all the way on the right is one of the sections of that? So imagine, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine that like this was actually, let's see how, how my uh, art skills are here. Imagine that this was actually like part of a, like if I were to take one of those tubes and chop it in half, so like if I chop this tube in half and you could see the inside of it, that's what this would look like. Oh, that's it. 
Yeah, so, right, so imagine that like, I've got my tube shape, right? And then I shock the tube shape like that and then take the front of it off so you can see the inside. That's what we're seeing here. Does that help? I mean, you're making that oh sound, but sometimes I don't know if that actually means that you get it. <laughs> Yeah. Like, you know, like you have, okay, let me not go that. Once a, a diploma, like, you know, and then you open the diploma and it lays out flat. Is it kind of like that? Huh. <laughs> Probably. No. Probably. I, I think it's just like a cutaway cube. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I was trying to like. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if the map analogy is super helpful at this point. I mean, well, because I'm looking at that like it's a tube. Yeah, it is like a tube. So then, it's not hollow though, it's filled with filaments. Right. So then is that like on the inner part of the... Yeah. <gasps> Come on. No, no, he has to report that, so don't say that. What's well, on the video now? Uh, he's just muted out. Oh, these are like sweat proof though. Huh. Okay. So you guys kind of have like the big structures of this. We're going to zoom in a little bit more now even to understand how this whole thing can actually shorten when the contraction happens, okay? And if it makes you feel better, this was the easy part. This next part's the harder part. All right, so we have to draw another zoom in level. So I'm going to zoom in really close on a uh, single myosin filament that is connected to, um, or not connected to, but next to a single actin filament. Okay, so yeah, so we're like zoomed in, right? Like this is a Z line. Um, you guys kind of see what this is, like a myosin and an actin? You can label those. Myosin, actin. Okay, so <clears throat> what has to happen is this. The myosin has a bunch of little things sticking off of it that kind of look like little golf clubs. And that golf club is going to reach out and grab the actin and pull it in. And then reach out and grab again and pull it in. And little by little, it's gonna pull that actin so that it comes down closer. And up here, It'll be happening both directions. So there'll be little, those little golf club feet will be grabbing the actin and pulling this one here. And then they'll be grabbing this actin and they'll be pulling it in towards the center. All right? Now, there is some chemistry that happens to make all of that work, okay? First thing we need to know is that, let's see. Green, maybe? We'll use green. There are these little sites, and we'll do a couple of them because there's multiple. There are these little sites on the actin that are specially set up for that little golf club foot to go reach out and attach. But your muscles aren't, shouldn't always be contracted. So your body has this system to keep your muscles from contracting until it's time to contract. Like right now, if you think about it, like you guys are sitting, most of your muscles are not contracted right now, right? If you were to lift something or have to hold something up, then you would have some contraction. But just at rest, we don't want these little golf club feet doing their thing. We want them just chilling, all right? So there's a special little structure that covers and blocks those sites, all right? That little 
substance there is called tropomyosin. Now, off to the side here, I'll write out what tropomyosin does. Tropomyosin blocks receptors. Um, actually, let's not call it receptors. Let's call it blocks attachment sites on actin. All right, so as long as that tropomyosin is there, your muscles can't contract. All right, we feel good about that so far? <clears throat> now, it gets more complicated. Tropomyosin has these little individual molecules all over the outside of it, all right? And those little molecules are called troponin. So troponin is molecules, oh, that's not how you spell molecules. Look it up for me. I'm pretty sure they're just molecules. Yeah. Okay, so the green things, what are those? The green things. Yeah. Those are the spot. Okay, so I want you to think about the green thing like a patch of Velcro. Where this little foot is going to reach out and grab that patch of Velcro. It is important. Trumpet in this? Yeah. What, is tropomyosin a protein also? Fair enough. All right. Oh, sorry, molecules on. I mean, a protein is a molecule, right? Yeah, I don't think. Molecules on tropomyosin. Sorry, that's. Is this thing in the way? Yes. Okay, the reason that troponin is important is that troponin <clears throat> binds to calcium ions and changes The tropomyosin. So the, the tropomyosin is on top of the green stuff, right? Yep, yep, it's blocking. Think about the green stuff is kind of like that little uh, that little patch of Velcro. And it, it's blocked by the tropomyosin. And troponin is the, or tropomyosin? Troponin. Troponin is the black stuff. Yeah, troponin is those little dots on top of the tropomyosin. Okay, so, so here's what happens. So when calcium ions, Ca plus, when they come swooping in here, they attach, well, here, so. They attach to the troponin. Once that calcium ion attaches, then it changes the shape and the tropomyosin moves out of the way. So I'll draw, let's see. Are we expected to remember the calcium ion? The calcium is important. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So honestly, the tough thing about IV is 
there are, I'll give you guys the past papers again. There are paper ones that don't ask a single question about this process. So you're responsible to know it just in case it shows up on the test. And I don't know, hey, there's gonna be some of you guys, like Mel over there is like super geeking out because Mel loves microbiology. Cool. Some of you guys might not, and you can't wait until we get to like go outside and jump and run. So it's all part of the same process, though. It's just a matter of how closely you zoom in, okay? So I want you to think of the tropomyosin as once it has um, so many markers. Once that calcium is actually attached, and so here we'll, I actually don't want to do it like that. So we'll draw it there. Once that calcium is actually attached. What is the calcium valley? It literally is like calcium, element number 20. It's like you drink milk and it's got calcium in it. That calcium then gets used in your body for this process. You know, in TOK, I did this um, uh, article and it said that there was an argument whether or not uh, drinking milk helps your bones or not. Yeah, I believe that. All right. So it's important right now also as you see these structures to understand that there's sort of a set of steps that happen to make muscle contraction happen. Okay, so I'm gonna write some of those steps over here so that we sort of start to understand this as a process and not just a bunch of structures, all right? So, um, we'll write it in blue. All right, so step one that you guys learned last time is the motor neuron transmits um, the action potential to the muscle. All right, so, so think back to last time, right? We know that motor neuron, it sends that signal and it, it goes across the synapse with the neurotransmitters. But once your muscle gets that signal, the signal causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions. So now we come back to the, the point of sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is full of calcium ions. They're just sitting in there. And when that signal happens, then it sends calcium ions out into this space. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'm going to write it over here, okay? So after that action potential happens, then sarcoplasmic reticulum releases Calcium ions. What is this discussing here? This is how your muscles contract. Oh, I'm running out of space, guys. Need a bigger whiteboard. Huh? We're getting close. We're getting close. All right. So. Calcium binds to troponin. Oh yeah, I, I might like take a picture and frame this. Huh? <laughs> I have softwares now. All right, so I'm covering. Okay. So it's 
<sighs> okay. So listen. This is important for you to understand about this process. Muscle contraction can't happen without the calcium ions. The calcium is sort of like one of the gatekeepers here. Wait, what can't happen Muscle contraction. So nothing does anything unless we get that calcium in there from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So like calcium is a super important component to this process happening. So the function of calcium ions is muscle uh, that, I would say that's a little too simplistic. I would say the function of calcium ions is to bond to troponin and uncover the attachment sites. Which that's kind of written in number three. I know I'm getting, that my writing's getting small, but I kind of have to conserve space because there's a couple more things to write. Yeah, what's up, Sophia? What's the A band? The, the, yeah, the, oh, the, so it's like the squiggly one? The A band, so the, the myosin is the thick stuff. Right, the A band is the whole width of the thick film. Oh, okay. We're just gonna keep going, okay? And then we'll. No, 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 you're good. No, hey, believe me, this is difficult. I get it. I sat here for two hours last night, uh, reading and writing and practicing this for you guys. So. Um, oh, thanks so much. Okay, but the, guys, we're not done yet. There's a thing that has to happen, and I've only got. 13 minutes to, to try and explain it to you. All right, so there's one more really, really important part of this equation, and it's ATP. Has anybody heard of ATP in your biology class? Thank goodness that some of you have, okay? ATP is attached to each of these little myosin arms. I'll put this over here. ATP provides energy for myosin arm. I'm actually not certain that that's the the perfect scientific term, but it's good enough for us right now. Uh, provides energy for the myosin arm to bend. All right, so here's what happens. And so stop writing for a second and try and, try and hear this process, okay? ATP, when ATP breaks in half, so A, the T stands for triphosphate. So ATP breaks in half into a DP and a single phosphate. All right, so literally like triphosphate means there's this adenosine with three phosphates attached. When one of the phosphates breaks away, the bond that was holding the phosphate there releases energy. So when it breaks, we get ADP and phosphate and energy. That energy right there, when it breaks, allows this guy, and it's actually like, it's probably more, it's a little bit longer. It bends. and grabs on to that, that receptor site, all right? So now, instead of having ATP attached to it, it's got ADP and phosphate. And that right there, that was the really, really important thing. When that thing bends and grabs, that's where the real like that's where the energy got spent where the action happens, okay? Remember, for that to happen, there had to be calcium that got released, and that calcium came from your, when your neurons tell the tissue to release the calcium, 
and the energy also has to be there. If you don't have that ATP energy already attached, it can't do its job, okay? Now, once it attaches, then, like, hang on, let's, let's do this. All right, so um, ATP breaks and releases energy to bend the myosin arm. The arm grabs the actin. At that point, it releases the, A, the ADP and the phosphate. It lets go of them. And then, once it's not holding on to them, it pulls the entire filament this way. Um, so this is where it's really hard to show in a drawing. You almost need like an animation of this thing. And, um, here, so we'll put that, we'll put that over here. ATP becomes ADP, phosphate, So once it grabs, then here I kind of feel like kind of feel like we should do this in, in like a set of steps. So um, you've got ATP just sitting there. All right, when the ATP breaks, we end up with ADP and phosphate, and then it pulls that way. Oh my gosh, I don't think I'm loving this version of my drawing. Maybe we'll make it better for next year. And then it pulls the act in that way, okay? So we see it's hanging out here, it reaches and grabs, it pulls it that way. And then a new ATP will come in and latch on. And once that new ATP latches on, then then it resets itself to do it all over again. OK, so it does this cycle. It's chilling with ATP. It breaks it and reaches out and grabs. When it releases those, it slides this way. And then the new ATP grabs on, which resets it and lets it do it all over again. And so it does that over and over and over again. It uses that new ATP to grab and pull, grab and pull. And when that process is happening, thousands of times all within the same fiber, that whole fiber shortens down. It's basically it, guys. My question is... Yeah, ask a question. I think I've got up here what I want to have up here. When does the sarcoplasmic reticulum re like release calcium ions? Okay, that's a really good question. So, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there is... And, and it's... There's a little bit... It's fairly involved and you don't have to know all the individual steps. What you need to know is that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is stimulated by the message from the motor neuron. So you guys saw how like the, the motor neuron sends the, the neurotransmitter across the synapse and then it activates a signal in the muscle fiber. That signal, what it does is it tells the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. So that's sort of like the next stage of that signal that you guys learned last time, is that the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium. Does that feel like it makes sense? Yeah. Make sure? Yeah, it makes sense. I can try and say it again. No, it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> guys, I know it's a lot, I really do. Um, hang on, I need to add on here. So the arm grabs actin, um, 
ADP and phosphate release actin slides and then last seven is oh my gosh new ATP attaches oh you guys How do we feel? This? Yeah. So what I'm trying to show there is that this is one of those little arms with that's just chilling with an ATP attached. So notice that this this little arm can't use its ATP and do anything because if it did and it reached out here, it'd be blocked by a tropomyosin. Now over on this one, it was able to reach out and grab because the calcium moved the tropomyosin away. And what are the black dots? The black dots? That's the troponin. It's the actual spot where the calcium comes in and, and binds. That's a, so there, there's, another, there's another like term on there that you guys didn't actually have to know, um, but you will all know this from your biology class. Um, in and around, oh crud, what if I would have fallen and it was on video? <laughs> all right. So, in and, in and around the sarcoplasmic reticulum, there are actually a bunch of mitochondria and what are mitochondria, good science students? Powerhouse. They're the powerhouse of the cell. So literally all mitochondria do, mitochondria make ATP. So there are a bunch of little mitochondria in here making new ATP to feed that process. You guys, that was a lot. This is like a 40.